welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm your co-host, Michael Walker, and with me, as always, is my good friend, Mark Bigney. How are you doing? Fantastic, Mark. Way to pull that in. Pronouns are hard. They are. And uh, I just want to say, in addition to hard, we, we've now been in the board game publishing arena for just under uh, a, a week, and I have to say that our flagship product, Roll a Six Win a Cookie... Is uh, I, I'm afraid we're going to discontinue it after only a week. The replacement costs for missing parts Oof. are killing us. Astronomical. People keep saying my box is empty now. Please send more cookies. It's a whole thing. They ask for it. it's it's the expansions. Once we listed the expansions, upcoming expansions, then they they looked at their the content they got out of the base game, and it was all like, no, we want different stuff, and it, it was just bad. Pressure's real. So, yeah. this is a board gaming podcast about board games. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And then we're going to talk about our feature game, Walker, our feature game this week. Feature game. Feature game. It's in the news. It's in our hearts. It's in our minds. It's HeroScape. So, Walker, what did you play last week? Well, in the vein of roll a six and get a cookie, this is obviously based off of our, our concept. It's called Twilight Inscription. It's the answer to the question no one asked. And three of us played Twilight Inscription, Mark. Now, did, now, did we play the same Twilight Inscription? <laughs> Every so often, we were asked, do you have more peanut butter cookies than we do? <laughs> and if you did, then then we sort of had a little cross-gaming experience there. Then there was the question of, did you get four peanut butter cookies before I did? Yes. So those two parts were interactive. But all this is to say that it's a roll and write. What else is new? It has the same conflict system. But... I don't even want to say that because roll and writes usually take 20 minutes. Sure. This beast took two hours. Well, that's one of the, re- well, with rules explanation, which was not inconsiderable. But this is, that's why I say it's the answer to the question no one asked. I'm sure lots of people are asking for variations on Twilight Imperium. That I'm sure is something we asked for. But the question in particular, and this is an interesting design space, and I was vaguely curious about Twilight Inscription, largely because of the designer. The designer's James Kniffen. He did Civ and New Dawn. He's got some interesting ideas, and he can riff on some fantasy flight traditional nonsense and sometimes produce something interesting. But the question is, how far, how heavy, and how ponderous can you make a roll and write game? And the answer is Twilight Inscription. Too far. Definitely too far. This is very much the standard roll and write structure where, as Walker says, there's precious little player interaction. It's the same conflict mechanism as either Seven Wonders or Paper Tales to list a a mediocre drafting game or an excellent drafting game, respectively. But here, it's just one tiny element amongst many. In point of fact, you might be apt to get more points out of military just out of exogenous factors of just building ships for building ships' sake, as opposed to beating up your neighbors. That's how ancillary the interaction is. Or or it was, it was the other thing where when you play Roll and Rights, you never look at your opponent's boards. There's actually rules yes. in this game that tell you you can't. So you, th- you think you can, you know, follow along? No, no. You <laughs> don't get to do that. Well, besides this, going on. It's this massive noise. Now, normally when you're playing a roll and write, whether it's Welcome To, whether it's the Clever Games, any of them really, there's a relatively small universe of things you can do. But usually there's a smattering of this, that, and the other. Like here you're filling out a matrix, here you're filling a list, here you're going ascending order, here you're going descending order. Twilight Inscription just decides to blow that up to the, to the logical possible conclusion. And again, one is left wondering why. I mean, if you really like the structure of roll and writes, but you want then just to be much longer and with some more bling? Because the texts weren't interesting, which reminded me a lot of... You have the same beats of Twilight Imperium, right? You have, yes. you have texts, you have votes. The votes weren't interesting. You have asymmetrical powers. The, the asymmetrical powers were kind of cool, but they trigger so seldom. All the ships had the same names. <laughs> All the ships had the same names, sure. It, it was lacking in... Actually, no. Let me retract that. I was about to say it was lacking in all the flavor of Twilight Imperium 4. That is not true. There is one aspect in which it was vaguely reminiscent of Twilight Imperium 4 in that one could see the specific interactions of some of the votes and some of the racial powers or some of the board positions and think, oh, that might arbitrarily hose somebody. That was the only time when I saw, when I saw that and said, this feels to me like Twilight Imperium. <laughs> Just so. And this was designed by James Kniffen. He's he has designed many excellent things. It's true. This is not one of them. No, uh, like Forbidden Stars as one of them. Yes, and that is Twilight Inscription. 
In the waning hours of Shucks, on the very last day, I got to play something called Heaven and Ale. This was published by Michael Kiesling and Andrea Schmidt and Eggerspiel about five years ago. And this is a game that I remember passing on for two reasons. Number one, because it looked like a reasonably generic Euro game of resource management. And number two, because it was released right around the same time as a number of other games about brewing either beer or wine or a variety of other alcoholic beverages. My disinterest in such games is so potent that... Reiner Knizia could design a game about wine making, and I'd be like, I guess I'll try it, maybe. Such is my disinterest. So when this was suggested, I'm like, all right, fine. But my fellows insisted that it was an excellent game. And sure enough, they're right. This is a brutal game of cash-strap margins, where you have to lay tiles, and at best, you'll be breaking even about half the time. And when I first got, got explained how the game works and how you purchase tiles and, and how the, the fundamental economy of the game functions, my question was, so how do you make money? And of course the answer was, with great difficulty, because I thought I'd forgotten something, like some sort of basic income phase or something that happened on the reg where you get money. No, 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 no. You have to work very hard to get money. And even then, that's not the, that's not the goal. The goal of the game is to merely advance up resource tracks. It's not a game of tracks upon tracks upon tracks because it's purely about accumulating these resources. In a nod to standard Ryan and type scoring conventions, at the end of the game, your score is the lowest of your available resources. Some of your resources you start out negative, some of them you start out around zero. So you're just dragging these resources laboriously up, up, up around the track. And it's one of those games of incredible tight economies where it's very satisfying. Everyone there is suffering with you. It's excruciating to get anywhere. And so even mild progress feels like a triumph. The other thing to note about Heaven and Ale is that the core mechanism is exactly the same as that of the first half of every round of Wonderland's War. You're on this big rondelle, you move to a space, you take a thing, and you can move wherever you like, but you can never go backwards. And so that's the fundamental tension of grabbing things before other, pe uh, other players can. You look down the track and you notice, oh, that's really good, but can I get a couple things there before there? How fast are my opponents going? That kind of grabbing things before other players do feels a lot more interactive and a lot more tense than simply, here's an array of first two goals, see who gets there first. The subtle changes can make all the differences in context like this. Heaven and Hell was a delight. I'm told that the expansion is garbage. I don't know if that's true, but certainly based on the rankings, it looks like a lot of people who really liked Heaven and Hell did not enjoy the expansion modules at all. This is a game I would happily return to. It was, as I say, delightfully tense. Heaven and Hell. I was even willing to forgive it its theme. Speaking of games from Shucks, played Blood Rage with a listener and the other pod boys from Board Game Barrage. I, no, stop. It's stop, a thing. Stop making pod boys a thing. Pod boys is going to be a thing. Oh, man. It, make, it fills me with too much giddiness. So this sort of emphasize what I think about Blood Rage is the fact that if you play with people who don't play very often, sometimes it can go off the rails a little bit. Still... Just because if someone really knows the cards or knows how to manipulate the board, they just get ahead of the game before other people get to react. Oh, sure. But the game state itself doesn't fall apart. No, 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 not at all. Just yeah, there, what... there's absolutely the benefit of experience. But the, the, I was just curious if you were trying to induce to it the kind of fragility that you see in some other games where by virtue of a discrepancy in experience, the game state becomes so fragile that it spins out of control. No, not at all. Just, just one person got like all three Loki cards... And then their score just sort of like spiraled out of control type thing. I see. It was close between the other players, but one player, not so much. But still, really enjoyed it. Blood Rage. Also, Mark, you and I, since I also played this at Shucks, and you and I got to play it as well. Fun Facts. I talked about Fun Facts coming out. This is another Repo production. They also did Just One and So Clover. All of these party games are fantastic. Fun Facts has lived up 100% to what I wanted it to be. It's sort of amalgamation of wavelengths and wits and wagers. You have this sometimes interesting question that you're going to write down a number for. Like, let's say, what is your ideal square footage of a house that you want? That's or, right. which, you was terrible, which was terrible, which was so terrible. Or really good ones like on a scale of 1 to 100, how has your day gone so far? <laughs> I don't know if that's one of the better so ones. So you write your name on this little arrow, and the first player puts theirs out face down, and then in clockwise order, everyone sort of either thinks that their day has gone better or worse, <laughs> and then when it gets back to the first player, they get to sort of nudge theirs where they think it should be. You turn over the lowest one, and then you see if they go in ascending order, and then you get points 
for all of the ones that are in ascending order. So the premise of the game, to a certain extent, is how well do you know the other people around the table? Fine. And then there are some questions that merely rely on that. Then there are questions that are, how well do you know the people around the table, and how well do you know their ability to gauge their own state? That's another level of complexity. And those ones, like how good is your day going, on in general, how much do you follow the rules, those start to get, get a little bit wobbly, where people reveal the results and you're like, really, Walker, that's what you think about yourself? That's fascinating. But then there are the ones that I loathe, which are how well do you know your friends and how well can you estimate your friend's ability to estimate things, which is a level of complexity and a level of abstraction that I'm not really down with. Like, what is your ideal square footage of house? I don't know what square footage is. I can't visualize square footage. Number of bedrooms probably would have been better in that case. There was another one, how many M&Ms can you fit into your mouth? And we revealed that that Huey has no ability to, to visually conceptualize how much room there is in his own mouth. The one that I really liked was, how many hats do you own? Nice, objective, clear, but nonetheless evocative of something about people around the table. And I find, quite frankly, the ratio of hits to misses to be far too low in terms of those questions. The good questions are fine. It's an, it's an okay party game. I'm fine with it. But then there are just so many where, like, I don't know how to answer this, much less how, uh, how, uh, like, how good can Louis visually identify these things? And what kind of house does he want, etc. That level of speculation, not my thing. Yeah, but it takes, it's a very quick little game. Sure, so is Just One and So Clover. This is true, but maybe some people don't enjoy those. Hopefully, they'll enjoy this. Oh my goodness. I know. I feel so bad for them. I'm sure they might be out there, though. Fun Facts is designed by Casper Lapp and put out, like I said, by Repos Productions. I really like Casper Lapp. Casper Lapp is a great designer. Casper Lapp has designed Magic Maze and Gods Love Dinosaurs. One game you like and one game you don't, but. It's true. (laughs) This one eh, doesn't really do it for me. In addition to this being the week after Shocks Walker, there are currently people in Essen celebrating Spiel, which is a convention that we cannot afford to go to. And one of the things that I saw was a listener who had picked up a complete set of Albedo, the delightful science fiction blind bidding slash deck building game. And I got to return to Albedo myself, got to try the Space Pirates again. What's cool about Albedo is, again, the notion that it's blind bidding, but the truly excellent bids are the ones that can accommodate for their possible loss getting the second or third place and being able to make something of that. And I think doing that reliably, as well as the ability to, shall we say, big league your fellow opponents, is what differentiates an Albedo winner from, shall we say, an Albedo less than winner. And the Space Pirates are interesting in that their deck is much larger than the starting deck, and it contains a number of very, very powerful cards, and the rest of their cards are garbage. And so the challenge of the Pirates is to thin their deck as quickly and as ruthlessly as possible so that they can get to something vaguely functional. And that is a different kind of challenge, or at least puts a different pressure on different elements than the standard deck. And then, of course, there's the Yggdrasil deck, which is yet further more bizarre, and I have even less experience with that. I love Albedo. It's the the little game that could. I'm glad more people are discovering it. And it's so simple and quick that it really is a delight to bring to the table. That's Albedo, specifically the Space... Oh, I'm sorry. It's not Space Pirates. I've been missaying it the entire time. Punctuation matters. It's Space Pirates! Oh, sorry. Yes. Very much so. Got 51st State back to the table again. I know I just talked about it recently, but it deserves to be talked about a lot. 51st State Master Set. And... Who's the master here? I don't know. And it just leads to... It just really... I really enjoy how the different decks, all the different expansions really change up the game. So we went back to one of the original from the box, the winter, and it really brings into cycling your buildings. It, it has a lot of cards that will give you the the construction tokens and a lot of buildings that give you brick and this is sort of like a strategy of just building on top of your own buildings destroying parts loved everything always loved 50 for state ignasi trebacek portal games if you ever have a chance to try it definitely give it a go played a game called renegade Actually, when playing Swords Around the Throne, which is the game crafter published Renaud Verlac Napoleonic's game, the pieces are very clearly cut by a, a laser cutter. And so they're full of soot and they smell a particular way. It was actually nostalgic. It reminded me of early Victory Point games, games because they would, in point of fact, come with a, a little monogrammed handkerchief that you could wipe the soot off of your pieces. And Victory Point Games hasn't been doing that for a while. And indeed, Renegade, published by Victory Point Games, is past that. So they, they, they evolved to slightly more contemporary methods of production. And Renegade is a co-op deck-building game, nominally 
really about hackers. I found it in practice to be a very themeless kind of puzzle exercise, mostly about even just getting around the board was difficult. <laughs> there are four colors of resource, essentially. And one of the resources lets you move, one of the resources lets you push things around, one of the resources lets you convert things, broadly speaking, and one of the resources lets you attack things, broadly speaking. The broadly speaking is a bit of the problem because the costs are a little bit all over the place. The conditionals, each color works slightly differently in different contexts. Each color has their own special kind of square token that then gives you a, a more powerful version of their fundamental effect. So I, I, it was one of those games where I constantly had to look back to the reference to figure out how to do basic things. In addition, it was also one of those games where, oh, you just don't get to move this turn. You have no ability to move your avatar around the server, so figure out a way to make it work. That part I found enjoyable, the sort of navigating the vicissitudes of what your hand might have, and the constant uh, deck churn, because you can buy things relatively cheaply all the time, was kind of interesting, but at the same time, your deck never changes its 15 cards. What I didn't find necessarily interesting was, again, the constant referencing to the rulebook, the fact that there were subtle differences between space, which they call partition, tile, which they call server, and board, which they call network. I wish they just called them space, tile, and board. That would have been fine, because it's one of those instances where special effects can rest entirely on the differences between those two words. Now, with more play, I'm sure I'd be able to get more, that more under my deck. It was alright. It was okay. I, I didn't find it particularly gripping. I played it solo. It comes highly recommended solo. Multiplayer, I don't think, would add considerably to the experience because you can't really combo off each other too, too much. And again, it would mostly just, I think, make the game last longer than it should because every player will just increase the length of the game proportionally. I might be willing to go back to it if someone were particularly keen, but as it was, I found it a relatively forgettable experience, and its attempts at theming were mostly to the detriment of the, of the gameplay, as opposed to really setting up a thematic world of being renegade hackers fighting against the man. Besides, I know the man. He's an okay guy sometimes. Actually, no, he's a bit of a jerk, but, I mean, really, you don't have to hack into his stuff. That's Renegade by Richard Wilkins, Victory Point Games. I got to play an adorable game, Mark, called Flamecraft, where you're in a little town with artisan dragons, and they all help you do the little cooking food or making little crafts. They're all very helpful in this way. The artwork is adorable, which is almost as adorable are the puns, Mark. You will be sad that you <laughs> didn't get to play because of the puns. Like, there is a honey shop, Mark, and it's, and it's run by Nunya. And the name of the shop is Nunya Beeswax. You could also, maybe if you got hungry, Mark, you could go over and have some Draco Bell. <laughs> All of these awesome little places. Oh, and there are man. many, many more. Even the names of the dragons sometimes are very funny as well. Tons of hilarious stuff. So what you're doing <laughs> in Flamecraft are is you're placing your, your worker, your one worker, which is a dragon. And you're, I would hope so. And you're going around these different stalls. And there are two different things when you, you can do when you go to the stall. You're either improving, well, I guess you're improving both ways, but you're playing another dragon to that area, and then you get to activate the dragon, and then you get to activate the shop. Or you're playing an enchantment, which will make that shop better, and then you get to activate all of the dragons that are there. I would play this game again. Very fun Lots of resource manipulation, but still very interesting. It's the end of the game, the unknown, because if one of the decks empties out, or sorry, one of the particular decks empties out, then you only get one more turn. And I thought it was a little bit stressful, and it did work out that way. It's like you have no idea, and it was the the dragon deck. So there was some places where you could draw a bunch of cards, and it, and it emptied much faster than I thought. And so you have to know when to score your points. Very interesting game. Looking forward to trying again. This is designed by Manny Vega and put out by Cardboard Alchemy. Flamecraft. You'd think your dragons would be a little more afraid of stalls. Well, with it that causing them to crash to the ground. Yes, yes, Mark. Yes, dragons. Dragons fly. That, yeah, I know. Very that, funny. That, that's the see that. Yeah, yeah, that's a pun. I thought you liked puns. Funny ones, yes. Okay. Been playing more Massive Darkness 2 Heavenfall. The campaign continues, and now I'm in a position to comment on the campaign elements. Basically, the way Massive Darkness 2 decides to structure a campaign is it looks at a single session and says, okay, a single session is about 90 minutes or so, and during that session, uh, heroes will go from level 1 to usually about level 5, and they'll get treasure to compensate. What if the campaign session, a campaign system stretched that out to around 8 scenarios, about 60 minutes each, 
and they level up possibly all the way to level 10 over the course of all of those eight scenarios. So in other words, it basically just chops up the scenarios into smaller little bits and makes the experience progression a little bit slower, but raises the level cap. All told, this is not a bad way to do things. It's certainly better than the system they had in the first Mass of Darkness, where the balance was just wild and heroes were overpowered by scenario two. And they seem to have gotten the balancing a lot closer to ideal. The progression is just enough so you feel like you're actually getting somewhere from session to session. And I do appreciate the, sh the shorter little bite-sized sessions. Now, do I miss trying different classes and different character powers each different session? Yeah, a little bit. But I do find that the snappy combat encounters do make up for a considerable... Now, it's nowhere near the level of brevity and engagement and intensity that you're going to find in a, a scenario of, say, Fate Forge Chronicles of Khan, which we've talked about recently in terms of campaign games. But it is definitely preferable to just stretching the experience out without either shorting, shortening the scenarios or, worse yet, emburdening it with yet more paperwork so that you're trying to let the Massive Darkness combat system, which is not particularly sophisticated, shoulder the weight of a, a campaign system more akin to a Gloomhaven or an Oathsworn, which would be a bad call. So as it is, it's perfectly okay. I'm mostly going through it with the enthusiasm of my colleagues. This is with Huey, Louie, and Louie, and they're loving it. They're all over the campaign system. They're all over more, more sessions of Massive Darkness 2. And so I can assert that, like many of their efforts, give Coleman or not two cracks at the apple and they'll probably get something that's at the very least functional and amusing. And as I say, this is probably my last foray into the world of purchasing a massive, sprawling, dungeon crawl-esque kind of stupid dice chucker. So I'm perfectly pleased with w what we've got. So I'll probably be continuing on with the campaign of Massive Darkness 2 Heavenfall. And I have to say that I'm very pleased that they managed to get it in a workable state. Mark, we got a, a review copy of a game called Oneronauts, designed by Alexander Novetsky and put out by iGames. And Noveski is the same designer that did Mysterium. And I really think he sort of boiled down what at least I enjoyed about Mysterium, figuring out what cards everyone has to its essence. So you're putting out a word, and you have a hand of six cards, and you're placing one of the, you know, abstract type, pictures like all of the Dixit slash Mysterium games that closest that will match that word the closest and then you're going to shuffle all the players play one card you're going to shuffle in a dud and then put them out well a random card a random card it's not necessarily a dud well it has been for us <laughs> and uh you're going to shuffle in a random card and then you're going to lay them out and everyone gets to vote on who they think the dud is and I think it's not perfect it's not like Mysterium where it's like this, you know, intricate sort of figuring out, but it's sort of, it's, it's so fast that I think, and Mysterium takes so long, I think this is the ideal sort of game for me. I agree that it, it does a good job of boiling the, the essence of Mysterium down. Look, as far as I'm concerned, all of that, all, Alexander Nevsky can spend the rest of his career riffing on this one idea. And I hope he's very successful during the entirety of it because anybody who invents Mysterium gets to keep doing stuff like this. So there are a number of things that I structurally actually find it improves on Mysterium. One of them you already mentioned, it's, it's vastly shorter. Mysterium is a little bit long for what it is. I happily, happily play it, but I do appreciate the, the reduced length. The other thing that it does is it constantly has everyone be the guesser and the clue giver. Right, And that, that structurally I vastly prefer. I adore code names, I adore Mysterium, but I do prefer structures like Just One or Oneronauts, where it's the case where everyone gets to participate in both of those two different skills. It also means that you don't have to set one person off to the corner and be silent for the entirety of the game, which I feel a little bit socially alienating. Now, that having been said, I find the quality on the, as you say, Dixit style, which is to say vaguely abstracted, surrealist, absurdist situations on the cards... I don't like them nearly as much as the Mysterium cards. There's something about the style, there's something about the level of abstraction and absurdity that strikes me as a little, slightly too literal, a slightly closer to the end of, say, a Codenames Pictures style of art. Uh, it, it's not to my taste. I don't really like it as much. Furthermore, the other thing that Mysterium does really, really well, and why it, it, it actually is worthy of its length, is there are three different kinds of matching that you need to do to the again, aforementioned Dixit-style art. And that 
level of progression, that variety, I think really improves on the experience. And Onira Knots, at the end of the day, it's good that it's so short, because of how incredibly random it is. You might not have any good cards. Someone might have the perfect card. The top deck card might be so perfect <laughs> that no one would ever think that it was random. It's it's all over the place. Yep, like the word was, was it cockroach? We had insect. Insect, that's it. And we all oh, we all thought this is great. We, we all, all thought we were great. We all had bugs in our hands. We all hands. had bugs in our hand. But unfortunately, so did the, so did the top of so the we deck. Had four insects sitting there, and we had to guess which one was randomly added. So it was just a crapshoot. Yeah. And you might think, oh, that's only going to happen. One. It's happened a couple of times. Yes. So the, it's, oh, good, yeah. it's good that it's as short as it is. I would happily play on Aeronauts. It is definitely a filler length game as opposed to a main event sort of game, you know, 90 minutes, which is what Mysterium is. But honestly. Yeah. The other <laughs> so, one, the other one, just because it's funny, the, the word was firefighter and the top of the deck draws a fire hydrant. Yes. Ugh. It was, it was just perfect. <laughs> and that is. On Aeronauts. On Aeronauts, sorry. Got to play Now Boarding. Now Boarding is a game by Tim Fowers, who has done Burgle Brothers and Burgle Brothers 2. Shockingly enough, uh, same same designer. Uh, this is published by Fowers Games, and this is a real-time cooperative game of getting passengers to their destinations. Now, you might ask yourself, Mark, why on earth, someone who is easily triggered and stressed out by travel, would you play a game like this while traveling? And the answer is, because I'm not a smart man. So psychically, I found it a bit of a shock to the system. Now... In practice, though, it did highlight a couple things that I've been talking about recently. You may remember that when we were talking about wormholes, I commented that it wouldn't take much to inject a lot more personality into the experience, because nominally in wormholes, you're just delivering passengers to destinations. In now boarding, you have pictures of the passengers, and they're going from city A to city B. That's all the information that they have on them, other than how much money they're going to give you, which is basically a function of how far they're going. The cartoony portrait of the passenger all by themselves makes puts an entirely different dimension on what is happening, especially as some of them get more and more furious and explode into a caldera of rage and issue the most dreaded of things, the complaint. Oh, no. You lose the game if you get a certain number of complaints. And so you start talking about, you know, shunting them onto Dallas-Fort Worth and letting them rot in their own juices. You look over the complaint file and see that it is in entirely occupied by children, and so you, you wonder about some 12-year-old Karen being like, I want to speak to the manager, and it's just a whole thing. That alone gives it a lot more personality. It's a very tense experience of logistics, getting people from point A to point B, passing passengers off between people, because one bit of a thematic nonsense, they do not get more angry while they're in the air. So they may want to go east, but you can send them west and just have them constantly shuffle around on planes forever. And they just are perfectly content to just sit there. I, get, I don't know. Maybe we have to assume there's free alcohol on all these flights. But that, aside from that part, it, it's reasonably thematic enough. The other benefit that it has over something like wormholes is you actually need to invest in your airline to make your plane go faster and be able to hold more people. And that trade-off is interesting in how to spend your money and the constant increased pressure of more and more and more and more passengers flooding into your system and looking over and saying, please, please tell me you're going to JFK this turn. It's like, well, I wasn't planning on going to JFK. Please, please go to JFK. I can't go to JFK this turn. Thanks for going to JFK, is what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> <laughs> now boarding was a, was very engaging. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I don't know that it's top tier in the sphere of co-op real-time games. It's also not helped by a rulebook that is, I would say, arguably flatly wrong. And I, but it was obviously flatly wrong, and so I had to go looking online to see. You know, it was the thing. I was like, that can't be true. I got to go check an FAQ. And sure enough, it works the way you might think it does, instead of the way that the rulebook actually says that it does. And I would happily play it again. I don't know if I'd suggest it. Lovely little box, though. Charming art. Lovely sort of 1950s airline aesthetic, complete with smug and or obnoxious and or jerking looking passengers that do nothing but whine and complain and won't stop talking about how they wanted to go to JFK three weeks. Anyway, that was now boarding. Lastly for me, since we're talking about toy games, man, did we play a toy game. Return to Dark Tower. Oh, was there a toy in that? I didn't notice. Giant tower that screams at you and <laughs> ear piercing howls and the such. Okay. Did you find the wolf noises to get tiresome? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There was, there was a lot of wolves. Mark. There were a lot of wolves. There were a lot of wolves. <laughs> this is designed by a whole slew of designers, nonetheless Isaac Childress and Rob Davio and then it's put out by Restoration Games and it's sort of like a take on the original Dark Tower sort of metelli tower in the middle of the board that speaks to you. Yeah, this one doesn't speak. 
This is an app driven. You said it was pandemic y, and I think that's probably true. At least you have a little bit more agency in terms of advancing the victory conditions as compared to pandemic, but it's very much, you know, random threats start spewing out, and you have to put out fires to give you time to go pursue your victory conditions. And I, I'll say two things primarily about Return to Dark Tower. Number one, the app integration was relatively unobtrusive most of the time. So for just as, as one example, this is one area where I think the toy really added to the experience. Most of the time, when a game is heavily app-driven, you need to tell them whose turn it is and what they're doing on their turn and when their turn is done and various other things. In Return to Dark Tower, when you're finished your turn, you chuck a little plastic skull into the top of the tower. And the app then knows that your turn is done. And so you can go several turns in a row, not even touching the darn thing, if it's the case that you don't need to. And I really appreciated that. And it really made me feel more like I was playing a board game rather than wrestling with an app in conjunction with a board game. The other thing, though, about the Toy Factor is, oh my goodness, this is an expensive and cumbersome game. <laughs> For the gameplay that you're getting... The, the value added from the toy, it's a, it's a novelty. It's a very impressive novelty. It lights up and it makes the same like three or four relatively poor audio samples over and over. Those will be the noise of the monsters. This one doesn't speak. This does not have the power of human speech. So instead, every time the, the, the wolves activate, you get to hear the same wolf noise. And as we mentioned, it gets a little tiresome. He'll spit out skulls at you every so often. And the Dark Tower will spit out skulls and light up and give you various lit up pictures telling you that this kind of action is a little more difficult to this, that, and the other. Emphasis on little more difficult. Yes. yes. Very arbitrary. Yes. And I have to say that as a novelty, I was diverted. I thought that it was a, a cute little gimmick employed well that aided, that added to the experience rather than detracted from the experience all told. Does that mean that it is worth paying four times as much as, say, uh, any other recent pandemic-ish hobbyist release? No, I don't think so. Not at all. It's so odd when you, because what you said was right. The 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 app was very hands off until that until it didn't need to be, and then was strangely so. Like in combat, it said it had you pick these random cards. Yeah. Which why couldn't it just give you two random cards? <laughs> it made you click on the on this phone when you yes. didn't need to. That which is was true. so weird. It it is an added step. I will say though that overall in terms of managing the combat the app does very very well because the way that we represented physically is you would need a different deck for each creature and the cards degrade in a very specific way. So you need to have separate sub decks for how the card degrades because you're not supposed to know in advance what's going to happen when you cause the card to degrade. So you probably just have to cover it up and, and anyway. So again, you get a lot of mileage out of the app. It does add to the experience, but you're right that it could have gone a couple ex extra steps. Also, just as, a, as another note with respect to the app, it doesn't shoo up your battery quite as badly as a lot of other apps that I've experienced. It needs to be on the entire time. The screen needs to be on the entire time, more or less. And my phone was not begging for mercy at the end of the experience. I'd happily play it again. I'd happily play it again too, but oh my goodness! Like, why does this exist? Like, I don't... it's true. <laughs> what does it bring anything to our hobby? No, other than a certain toy factor. But the, yeah. there are way yeah. better ways to do that. That was Return to Dark Tower, and those are the games that we played this week. Now onto the news and why it doesn't matter. A lot of game news this week for me. Cthulhu Death May Die is getting a Season 3 on the topic of silly games. Cthulhu Death May Die is probably one of our favorite cooperative dungeon crawl-esque type things. And the scenarios do add a lot to the table, so I'm very much looking forward to a Season 3. Uh, despite the fact that we are uh, increasingly dubious of Colmany or not and their general production practices. No, I was going to say, and by Season 3 it means this got a little bit more popular than we thought it would. We'd like to resell it now to people who want it. I'm not even sure that's true. I think it's just we've run out of other stuff to push. <laughs> We, we actually commented, we, we recorded an episode of our show, Pledge of Indifference, where we go over the crowdfunding stuff. We ended recording just as Kulmini or Not's previous project, the uh, the Dune War of the Rings spinoff thing, was announced. And I'm like, oh, we should probably cover that next Pledge of Indifference. But first of all, it was only a, it was a short enough campaign that it was done. And we never thought to mention it again because we were we had so little interest. So, Well, they could always just spin the Zombicide wheel again. <laughs> Well, they did that recently. They had to, they had to uh, space it out, I suppose. Yeah, so. they, they want to milk this for a few more years, so they're not going to completely go overboard. Look, there's precisely one project that Kulmini or not could announce that would generate any interest in me, and that happens to be Cthulhu Death May Die. So, or nope. if, they, if they redid a, a Dogs of War one, you know, because a lot of people are asking, you know, for a reprint of that because it's very hard to get. So that would also be a good sure. one. Sure. 
I don't really see that happening. No, it's not... no, no. I'm not saying there's any <laughs> chance of it happening, but I mean, there's some chance for they, interest. They purposes. U- they used to do more straight to retail stuff, right? Things like Ethnos. They don't really. Have, they haven't really done stuff like that lately. So they could theoretically decide to return to that and maybe republish Dogs of War, but who knows? True, but they, yeah, that could almost be a Kickstarter in on itself, like our our self published game Bonanza, where you just sort of. You know, like a Simon store. Why are you trying to ruin it? We were suggesting a good thing, and you're trying I know. to ruin it. Well, because that's that's the beast that is Kickstarter, Mark. Anyway, next up, there's going to be a Persona 5 card game. I'm a big fan of Persona 5. It's one of my favorite JRPGs. And Atlas and Pandasaurus are teaming up to make a cooperative card game, and it's going to be released next October. I was a little bit worried that initially it was just going to be a themed deck of cards to use with Millionaire, because in... Persona 5, you can play Millionaire. I spent a rather a lot of time doing that. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but no, this is going to be a full co-op thing. So look forward to it in 2023. Spiel 22, like you said, has ha- happened just a few days ago. Tons of games announced. Tons of things going on. You could definitely find all sorts of links to all sorts of brand new games being announced. And be ready. They are coming now. As an example, Cyclades 2. Really? Yes. Wow. A new edition of Cyclades, now with a modular map rather than the fixed map. So, see, Walker, there were these Pelopones. And these Pelopones could not get along, and so they had themselves a Peloponnesian War. Trust me, I've studied yeah. history. This I'm, is how I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you so far. So there's going to be a new integrated Heroes and Monsters track that's going to possibly supplant or replace the original. Details are somewhat light at the moment, but Bruno Catala has been letting certain details slip out here and there. And there's some pictures of prototypes available. Cyclades 2. Speaking of 2, Shucks 22 just finished like we've already went. And I would uh, I would like to thank Shut Up and Sit Down and Quinns. It was a wonderful experience all around. I love everything about it. It's all more more, more focused on just playing games rather than than like we just Buy talked stuff. about spiel buying stuff or Gen Con buying stuff. This is all just for the players. Tons of table space, never felt crowded. Run great. Shucks, if you ever have a chance, check it out. And we will be releasing our live show with Quinns probably next week. Patrons have already heard our roundtable discussion that we did with the people at Board Game Barrage. And actually, I just want to add a minor footnote to that one discussion because I realized coming out of it, we talked a lot of uh, we talked about a lot of things about the relationship of reviewers with publishers and of game designers and a variety of other things. We talked about editorial standards, which, as people who have listened to Bloat know, is one of my favorite topics. And it occurs to me that a lot of people don't understand one of the things that one of the policies we have with respect to review copies. We disclose all these when we talk about review copies, but something else that that uh, comes up rather often is people are concerned about the relationship between publishers and reviewers because they feel that review copies are some sort of financial incentive. And I just want to make absolutely clear, for the record, something that, that we've talked about before, but just to reiterate, uh, we never sell or trade any review copies we ever get. The only thing we ever do with review copies is give them to listeners. That's it. So we never see a dime as a consequence of them. And that was just a little coda to our discussion that we had at Chuck's. So I thought it was appropriate to stick it in here. Lastly, for me, we just put out a video for Space Station Phoenix. So if you want to check out uh, a video review, you can go to uh, Board Game Geek there or even YouTube. And if you feel like it, I think... It'd be nice to get uh, a video like on the front page of Board Game Geek so more people will know that we are now putting out videos. So throw it. Oh my, I'm not even going to finish. They didn't finish that. People I almost, know, people know where you were going. I almost threw up a little in my mouth there. I, hear, was, you, I hear you. All right. I hear you. You, you started it from a good place. Oof. On crowdfunding now on Backer Kit is the latest release from Matt Laycock of Pandemic Fame, co designing with Matteo Menapache being published by CMYK. So this is crowdfunded through BackerKit, as I said. BackerKit is breaking into the crowdfunding market in and of itself. It's got about 10 days left at the the time of this recording, and Daybreak is a cooperative game about stopping climate change. So whereas Pandemic was saving the world from viral infections, you know, a sort of abstract, not particularly relevant theme, they've gone for another outlandish, strange theme here about saving the world from climate change. So pure science fiction, both of them. Fake news. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm lo- I'm loving the fact that there's more companies to give Kickstarter competition. We have now GameFound. We now have 
backer uh, kit. Backer kit. Yep. I, I'm, what I'm not liking is the fact now that I have to go to different websites it's to true. find <laughs> all of these different projects. And more than likely now we'll get even more streams of different emails from all of these different places. <laughs> but anyway, that being said, like more competition is always the best. Absolutely. And finally for me, it is October, and October is the month of Arkhipov Day. And once again, we will be celebrating on October 27th, the anniversary of when Vasily Arkhipov saved the entire world. If you are alive or know someone who is, you owe your life to Vasily Arkhipov. So this will be the 60th anniversary. More details to follow, of course. But just so you know, mark your calendars. October 27th, the 60th anniversary of Vasily Arkhipov saving your life. And that's the news and why sometimes it totally matters. Now, on to the main review this week, which is Heroescape. Heroescape was designed by Stephen Baker, Rob Davio, and Craig Van Ness, published by Hasbro in 2004, and it is a serious game for serious people. It is in no way for children, and you can tell this because it's got brightly colored plastic, including an orc riding a dinosaur. This is a game for tryhards, for sweaty tryhards only. This is a game that would make Vital a sort of blush. This is a game for people who know what gaming is. And none of this stupid, childish nonsense that clogs up so much of our, of our hobby. This is about the purity of strategy and about pure mental brain power. Anyway, it was published in 2004 as a master set, and it was supplanted by waves of expansions. There was another master set with a Marvel tie-in in 2007. That license went precisely nowhere, despite their plans to expand that. There was another master set in 2004 called Swarm of the Marrow, which really expanded on some of the core ideas of Heroescape and their distribution model. More on that later. And then the death knell of Heroescape started around 2010 when they moved to the Dungeons and Dragons line, where previously this was a game about all manner of different things fighting each other, QV, Orc on a Dinosaur, and now just became repurposed D&D miniatures, despite the fact that they didn't even fit the appropriate scale. So... There were 13 waves of expansions published in total, some waves consisting of merely a box full of giant goodness, some of them consisting of six different skews full of pl plastic goodness. So if you want to get all in on Heroescape, oh boy, you better follow the cardinal rule that we have of Sentinels of the Multiverse, which is lift with your legs and engage your core. Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Heroescape? Unhelpful summary is, Mark, Heroescape is putting a rule set to your plain army man. <laughs> that is pretty well what it is. It is a Star Trek Star Trek episode where you take all of your heroes from history and <laughs> they fight it out in a in a ring. You name it. You have your like you already said Marvel guys, D&D, &D, musketeers, samurai, uh robots, orcs, pirates. You take your pick. Heroescape has it. It has a super light rule system on top of it so you get to play toys against each other. Yeah, the fact that this was released by Hasbro, indeed, <laughs> it could only have been released by Hasbro. When I first moved to the United States of America, I knew that I would not be truly an American resident. I say resident because I was never a citizen. Until I walked into my big box store, put down my $29.99 plus applicable taxes, and got me my very own copy of the, of the master set, Rise of the Valkyrie. And sure enough, I felt a, a, like an American that day. So true. And I think this is the theme that I'm going to go for, for this particular segment, because we're talking about Heroescape, because it's now on Hasbro Pulse. Yes. So you can get the new... On the topic of too many crowdfunding platforms. Yes. So you can get the new, in quotation marks, uh, Heroescape. Yes. And I just, I'm finding it very odd how different I feel about this particular Heroescape, because in essence, it's exactly the same thing. Yes. It is the same rules, the same tons of units. And should have the same feel, but it just doesn't. It's completely foreign to me because what Heroescape was, was exactly like you said. You can go into your local Toys R Us. You can pay such a low $30, yes. sometimes less because it's usually on sale. <laughs> and you get this giant box full of painted figures with a ton of terrain. And then every so often a new thing would come out or you could go down and, and pay your $10 and get a, a re-injection of more figures. Yeah. This is... 250 American in one go yes. for all of this stuff. And it, it has such a different feel. I, I agree entirely. I think it's appropriate that we that we lead off with this. Because I think we'll get to the merits of Heroescape as a game system later on. But I, I hate being essentialist about things. You know this. Like sometimes you say it's barely a game or, you know, X is not a Y. It's like, look, I don't care. To me, 
a lot of people are barking up the wrong tree because a lot of people are saying this is too expensive. Now, too expensive is subjective, and a lot of people have done excellent work comparing the total amount of quantity that one gets in what's available right now for crowdfunding in Age of Annihilation, for what it's worth, crowdfunding on, on HasLab. And basically, after you account for inflation, it, it turns out to be an okay deal. Just because this isn't the size of a master set with their crowdfunding. It's much bigger than that. Many more figures, a lot more terrain. And the master sets were really loss leaders. And it was the it was the individual expansions that were still very economical that you could get. But they were more or less how they, they made their money on the back end or didn't, case depending. The one key visual difference is they're not pre-painted anymore. The age of pre-painted minis is gone. At best, you can have a couple in a given release. You cannot have a box full of them anymore, even when you're charging 250 American dollars. Setting all that aside, I agree with you that there's something fundamentally different now by virtue of the distribution. One of the joys of HeroScape was that it wasn't really a hobby product in that sense. It was perfectly fine for hobbyist gamers. I would never tell a hobbyist gamer not to play with anything. Like, again, I don't want to get hung up on labels. But it wasn't a hobby product. No, and it gave you that feel because because it was available everywhere. You sort of have, you felt as you were part of this community that almost anybody could have yes. it. Yes, yes. Absent Gaslands, Gaslands is kind of a separate thing. It is... B- Actually, even more so than Gaslands, I would say, it was the most accessible entry into tabletop miniatures gaming. And it's not really a full tabletop miniatures game because it uses digital rather than analog movement. You move along hexes, but you get the same visual sense of the terrain. You get the same joys of army building. You get the same vague sense of uh, some some element of strategic and tactical decision making. And so it was just this bizarre intersection between toys and minis gaming that Gaslands captures a little bit of. But it's it, it's it's part of that feeling, like like that joy of being able to go to a dollar store and say, ooh, that's a Gaslands unit up on the shelves, right? That, that's kind of what I'm talking about. That's that spark. That's why I keep going back to Gaslands as a comparison. And so this, this thing, it may be worth your money, but it ain't HeroScape. It ain't, it ain't the same thing. That no, I- and it's, it's going to give you such a different feel because, like I said, even though you and I and other people have spent probably more than oh, yeah, yeah, 250 yeah, more, yeah. it hasn't felt that way. Like, if someone like, yes. loads this $250 thing and now it's sitting on your shelf, you have spent $250 on this yeah. thing that's not getting to the table. Because even though we love HeroScape, it doesn't get to the table. But that that $250 was so spread out over what we said, 2004 to 2010, over six years, yeah. right? And this does not feel as though it's going to be supported like that. It looks, looks as though it's going to be this one-time big thing, and I and I, I, I can't see it justified for the amount that our HeroScape has got to the table. This, for even for new players, I, I can't justify that, this, this price. And... In the previous distribution model, you could just get what you wanted. And I derived a significant amount of value from just the core set. When I didn't have much storage space, and when I didn't have much money for gaming, I just played the core set to death. And that was fine. And then when I had more money, I could get a unit here, a unit there. And then when storage space didn't become an issue and I was able to track down some of the old units, I did. But until then, it was driven exclusively by, I want these specific ones. Like, oh, I don't want the Roman Centurions, I, but I do want the Musketeers. Okay, I'll get the Musketeers and not the Roman Centurions. When you sell it all like this, just as a, as a, as a huge lump, ugh, it's, it's, it's another story entirely. You're right. It's just, I, I, it, it, it really highlighted the extent to which, to me, as much as I love Heroescape as a game, and I do, a lot of my enthusiasm for it is bound up as, uh, as a sort of, as, as a product. And it's a, now a fundamentally different product. Yeah, it's uh, like I'm going to compare the gameplay to uh, to Warhammer. Sure, and and it's and it's essentially that as well because you can pick and choose the units you want in Warhammer. You go, you buy what you want, and you can do that in HeroScape as well. You get what you want. So let's talk a little bit about the gameplay. It's very simple. I think I explained it to Huey in about five to ten minutes, and even then. Even with the universe of special actions and special abilities, he immediately in- understood how they worked because they're they're written in relatively plain language. And fundamentally, your choices are the classic elements of who do I have attack whom. There's a little bit of maneuver because one of the great things that HeroScape does, which immediately elevates it above a lot of Games Workshop products. Let's just be let's just be blunt. A lot of Games Workshop games result in smashing your units against each other, and it's entirely a function of your army building. Heroescape at least internalizes 
the the idea that terrain modifiers have to matter. And so keeping the high ground in HeroScape is going to be one of your primary concerns if you want to do well, because those bonuses matter a great deal. On top of that, well-designed scenarios include glyphs, and so you'll be fighting over the glyphs. And so that alone, I think, elevates it above a lot of even good skirmish games that don't take positioning seriously. And let's be frank, far too many skirmish games don't take positioning seriously. So if you have, if you have any uh, experience with hero clicks, this sort of is the same sort of system. Because if in hero clicks, you get three activations. And that's what you have here in HeroScape. But you have to put... In, in Hero Clicks, you get to just choose when it's your turn. I haven't played it in a long time. Sorry if I'm getting this wrong. But it's one of the things, for whatever reason, I didn't like. You could have, like, a hero just sitting on the map not doing anything. And for some reason, this does not bother me. In, in Hero Escape, you, have a, you could have a ton of units, and some might just sit there for the whole battle because you're, you're activating cards. And if I activate this card where I have multiple units, the card I'm activating three of them. So I choose any three on the on the map, those three move, and then those three attack. So nice, easy, quick to move, quick to attack. And you do have to commit before you know what the initiative values are. It's surprisingly tense. I don't know how how high quality the decision making is, but it certainly feels like you're you're stepping out onto a limb when you decide what you're going to activate. Key to my mind also in terms of the innovations that Terrascape brings is the is the difference between heroes and squads. Heroes are single figures with multiple wounds, whereas squads are multiple figures with one wound each. And even more interestingly are common squads, because you can get multiple copies of common squads. So suddenly, for example, redcoats. If you have two squads of redcoats and you issue an order to redcoats, you can order any four of those redcoats, even though you might have eight of them on the board. And this gives you a certain degree of resilience and flexibility in terms of both army building and in terms of what you're doing. As the redcoats start taking losses, their operational efficiency degrades. On the other hand, a hero can often, especially if they're well defended, get to the middle of the action and stay there for a while with no loss of effectiveness. But on the whole, they tend to be less deadly than squads because squads can bring the volume of fire. And as time went on, I really want to emphasize the excellent design work that the the dev team did in terms of exploiting the design space, getting new special abilities, having old special abilities come to the fore in interesting ways, introducing new units which helped undercosted units perform. Uh, for example, for a long time, I'm not saying they did it, that, that they brought them up to par, but if you wanted to lose, you would take the gladiators. You take Spartacus and Retarius and, and, and Crixus and a couple of others. You'd get to 500 points. and uh, uh, Sorry, they'd be worth uh, under 500 points, but they would be terrible. Then they just, then they released a common squad of gladiators, which kind of sort of made them okay. Like, they brought them from awful to decent. And those are the kinds of things they were doing playing in the design space. And one of the reasons why I was so enthusiastic about the resurrection of Heroescape was because they were bringing back a lot of the people involved in that development work back to the table, like Craig Van Ness in particular. Rob Davio is busy off doing his other things, and uh, Stephen Baker is a legend in the field. He designed Space Crusade and, and Hero Quest and a lot of those other games, and so he wasn't actively involved in some of the later dev work. But you know, when Rob Davio started uh, started Restoration Games, for me, he was oh that Heroescape guy rather than the guy who did Risk, Risk, Risk Legacy for a long time, but. So they're, they're emphasizing the return to the fan community and to a lot of the developers that have been keeping the game alive in the, in the down years, as well as doing some of that solid development work in the aughts, makes me very happy. And I think the other key part we're going to see that's different between these two sets is I have a suspicion that the models are going to be like uh, miniature plastic, where the the original HeroScape was toy plastic. Yes. Which makes it a much more utility quite a thing because and another comparison comparison to Warhammer was Heroescape to me was the fun of building the map, whereas opposed to you, you you loathe building the map. I do. But it was it was all part of it. It's like building like the playing part was secondary. It was like building the map, uh, building your army, getting some sort of like combo going or just you know, the just the look of those particular units fighting together. And uh, if you're if you're ever gonna have children, it's like it's a toy that you yep. can just you can just put on the floor. They can it's like Lego. They can build the maps however they like. They can play with the figures, and they will not break because, like I said, it's just toy plastic. They'll enjoy it. It's a great way to get uh, uh, children into the hobby because the cards had two sides. You, you, we I always play. I've never played with the basic side, so I, I can't really talk about. It, but it, it it even simplifies a simple rule set even more. So it's a, a fantastic tool for getting children into the hobby. 
Robbie. Now, with respect to the breakage, uh, some people have been reporting, especially in the past few years, that the terrain tiles have become brittle and prone to breakage. I've noticed that, too. Some of my terrain tiles tend to break. Now, uh, if you've got a large collection, this is not a problem. Because a couple of pieces break, that's fine. You, you you probably have more terrain than you need. The figures, though, have remained resilient. I've used HeroScape figures to proxy for all kinds of things. Are the paint jobs great? Not at all. Do they have floppy swords and droopy gun barrels? 100%. But can you toss them into a bag and not care? Yes. And I share with you the concern that the new, that the new miniatures, the sculpts look really good. That's not necessarily an asset to a game of HeroScape. What bothers me the most, though, about the new figures isn't even just that they are unpainted. It's that if I want to get full use out of a, a, a new rejuvenated HeroScape collection, I will have to field painted and unpainted figures next to each other, and that will bother me to no end. Agreed. So I'm not alone. No. I mean, it's irrational, but it's just eh, the visual discordance. And yeah, the visual appeal of some of the terrain is undeniable. I mean, some of my favorite expansions are The Road to Forgotten Forest. This also, not only was it visually appealing, but again, it was their attempts to redress some of the game design deficiencies. Because, just, just to stress, HeroScape falls prey, as much as it emphasizes tactical positioning in a really fun way, and the army building, I think, is pretty much at, at the, the top of the list, it does have a bias in favor of ranged units. Ranged units are going to outperform melee units as a general rule. And, but they tried to help address that with things like Road, for, Road of Forgotten Forest, where on roads you get bonus movements to try to close distance faster. Uh, the Takala Jungle, which they released several years after that, which introduced cover bonuses and things like that. This was a good design yeah. team doing good work yeah. with toys. Jungle, water, uh, snow, lava, swamp, all these different terrain tiles. And, well... Let's just get into it because I don't think we're really <laughs> we're really emphasizing how many units, right? Because it, it, it's well, there were thirteen whole waves of, it, of it, be, it. It starts to become cumbersome, right? And yes. why and why why it hasn't gotten to the table as much as as it should? Because building the map is not nothing. Uh, figuring out what units you want to play because the stack is about I would say at least a foot high. If not more. No, 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 no. I've got one of each, and many of them are laminated. And it's not nearly. Enough. All right. Anyway, tons of units yes. to choose from. And then after you, and then knowing how they interact with each other, or if it's even a, a viable army, and then having to find all of these figures in, in the multitude of bags <laughs> or wherever yep. they are, it is not a huge, it's not a, a nothing thing. It's true. I will say though, that in terms of the army building there, like the fan work in the community of HeroScape is outstanding. They never stopped making top quality units. It's kind of like Nisei, but without the official recognition, right? And uh, in terms of army building, it's not a big problem. We were showing Huey the game, and I said, what kind of army do you want to build? He said, I don't know what are my options. I just started listing things, and he's like, I want, a, I want an army full of Valkyries. And there's this fan project called HeroScape 500, which just has balanced 500-point army lists that you can just throw in front of a new player. And so I didn't have to bother min-maxing this, that, or the other. I just took a HeroScape 500 army for him, and it worked, worked just fine. Now, as far as the terrain goes, yes, some people love setting up the, the map. You have to regard it as part of the game. I never liked playing with Lego. I just, I, it's just something about it. I, I find it tedious rather than enjoyable. And so, yes, setting up HeroScape maps is a pain. I do it because even independently of the game, I enjoy the end product. As a consequence, it doesn't hit the table enough. It's like any other, it ends up being just like every other hobbyist miniatures game. Setting up is cumbersome. Army building can be a barrier, although sometimes not. And sorting through, and no, no, normally in a, in a in a sort of hobbyist tabletop miniatures game, you have to worry about storing the miniatures properly, and that's a bit of a pain. Here, at least, you can just toss them all into a Ziploc bag or into a bin, and you're fine. But yeah, there's sorting and managing it. It becomes cumbersome, and that's why it doesn't hit the table as much as it should. That's true of pretty much every skirmish system imaginable. Even, say, For What Remains by David Thompson, published a couple of years ago. It's only three boxes worth, but even that, there's a substantial amount of sorting and organizing required to keep it all straight. It's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately. So I only have one gameplay thing left, and that is it has this interesting normal attacks versus special attacks and how it interacts. Sometimes it can be frustrating, but sometimes it can be very interesting as well. Yes, how special some special abilities trigger off of normal attacks only, but not special attacks. Special attacks don't get the height bonus that we mentioned, but defenders against special attacks do. It's a subtle interaction that, again, they've they've exploited very well with a lot of the clever development work they've they put on HeroScape. So, in the end, I think I just want to is is HeroScape something that you should look into? 
I would have to say no. I would say if you can get a hand on the probably, I shouldn't say plethora, but I'm sure there is just a base set because two large base sets came out. You might be able to pick one up on, on eBay and just try it out and see if it's something that you like. I'm not, I don't understand who this, uh, 250 set is for. If you're some, if I suppose if, if you never left HeroScape and you get it to the table all the time, then I guess that this is definitely a project for you. But even for me, this giant bin that I already have doesn't get to the table enough. I really don't want to add even more to it. And so it's just like another level, level of guilt that I don't <laughs> want. Yeah, I would say, so the secondary market for HeroScape is unfortunately not very viable for people who want to get into it. It's very expensive. If you want access to a complete master set, you're like, you're looking at a lot of money. I'm wondering if this, when this finally does come out, whether it might, maybe hopefully it will drop. Some. Or make it worse. Oh, make it worse. to get into it for the first time. Maybe. It's rough. I mean, I just, the, I am very, very glad to have been a consumer when HeroScape was released. To have been a gamer. It was a great time for, for, for me. Like, the hobbyist gaming market back in 2004 was still almost all like rear grand games in Mayfair. And that was pretty much the, the, the story, but there was this thing, this magical retail thing that happened. Yes. Now you can walk into a big box store and you can find pandemic and you can find code names and you can even find mosaic, a story of uh, civilization, for example, that's been showing up and, and that's wonderful, but it's still ain't hero escape. Hero escape was a magical thing. It happened. And I think it's over. I think it's done. Qua game. Excellent game. Is it worth the 250 bucks as a new skirmish experience when I've got a bunch of other skirmish games? When For What Remains exist, when even Titan Tactics exist, which didn't catch on and I don't know why I really liked it, or going whole hog and getting into some of those indie miniatures games, trying Gaslands, trying Horizon War Zero Dark, trying even Infinity or a Games Workshop product. I can't recommend it. It's just unfortunately the case you asked who it's for. It's for people like us. But who are willing to pony up another two hundred and fifty bucks? Or, or if you if you have children, this would be one hundred percent something I would I would I would rebuy if if I had children again. Yeah, but the you mean the original as opposed to the new thing? Uh, even the new one. Mm, yeah, I don't know. Well, time will tell. I think a lot will depend on the manufacturer. This would be a lot of spiky bits and a lot of this stuff, and it makes me disappointed. I mean, when HeroScape was 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 announced again, it, it recalled all the enthusiasm and I still love playing the game. Yeah. We pulled it out, played a session, it was just like old times. The rules come right back, it's a joy. There's some choices to be made, but mostly it's a game of smashing people against each other and it's surprisingly sophisticated, especially when compared to a lot of other mainstream miniatures games. I think it was just very interesting how how they just felt so different. That's all. That's for sure. Yeah. But I I I think it's done. I think it's over. It had its moment. It can live on in our hearts and indeed in our basements. <laughs> it's true. I will never get rid of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, me neither. I I, I I, got rid of my collection once, and it was in a moment of, of utter despair when I didn't have any storage space available. I, I had my collection. It wasn't a complete collection of HeroScape, but I had what I wanted, and I was going from a place with lots of storage space to zero storage space. And in moments of confusion and despair, I sold my HeroScape stuff, make, making a profit for what it's worth. I also literally threw away thousands of dollars of miniatures because I just had no place to put them. This is all my Rackham stuff. I had a complete collection walker of everything in the new pre-painted confrontation set and everything in the AT-43 line. Everything. Everything. And I had no way to get rid of it. I literally threw it away. That's how mentally ill I was. No, seriously. Yeah. When, when I engage in periods like this, it is literally mental illness. And I, anyway, <laughs> setting all that aside, I regret nothing having reacquired HeroScape. If you know somebody who wants to get rid of, a, of an entire collection... And they're willing to part with it for something less than, than an insane quantity of dollars. I heartily recommend it as a toy. This new product is something else, though. And this new product, it just, you know, you know what it honestly looks like to me? It looks like the second coming of hate. You know, 250 bucks for a miniatures game with lots of plastic coming out. And it's just like, eh, stick to the ones you got. I don't know. And that makes me sad. It does. Because HeroScape was never hate. HeroScape no, was joy. It was joy. It was joy. But I think it's gone now. It is. Our childhood's ended, Mark. <laughs> I wasn't a child of <laughs> No, I know, I know, but we can pretend. <laughs> well, on that sad note, thank you very, very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find all our contact information at sowronggames.com slash contact. You can find lots of interesting stuff at sowronggames.com. Please check it out. Warm Boy put in a lot of effort to put in that content. It's great. Sowronggames.com. 
Anyway, we, re we read everything you send us, and we'll get back to you if we can. Thanks again for spending some time with us, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bicken. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>